Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are gonna be talking all about footprints for bottom terminated components. Now we've received a lot of footprint questions in the past, and of course, finally, somebody asked about how to break up the paste mask on central pads or die attached pads on bottom terminated components. So of course, that inspired this video. We're gonna take a look at several footprint examples. We're gonna see what we can do with bottom terminated components. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Bottom terminated components include a wide variety of components, some of which are in a standardized type of packaging, others that include, for example, modules that would mount as surface mount components onto a PCB. Now, this video was inspired by a question that we received on one of the one minute design review videos. This design review came from John Hatfield, and you can see here that we have a question from James McCall. James McCall writes, can you explain why you'd break that pad into four smaller openings. Now I'm gonna show you that pad I'm referencing in All Team Designer. Here I have the project pulled up from John Hatfield. If I go into 2D and we just zoom in here and we put this into single layer mode, you can see that we have a quad flat pack package here and you can see that it does have a central die attached pad. This is normally for thermal dissipation from the pad into the PCB. And then you can see here that we have a bunch of vias in the pad to connect it to the internal ground plane as one would normally do. Now, of course, the thermal attach isn't really needed here on this pad because this design is gonna go through reflow soldering and you're already connecting those vias to an internal ground plane with the purpose of dissipating the heat. So it doesn't really make sense to also do a thermal attach on the pad itself. But if we click over here, here and we go over to the top paste layer, you can see what the paste mask looks like. The paste mask here is turned on and you can see that it is a wide open paste mask and it covers all of those vias. Now if we go back into 3D and flip this over, you can see here that he did tent the vias on the back side and that is going to prevent the solder from wicking through to the back side of the board, but you can see here that we still have this wide open paste mask. So not the best paste mask design, but compensated through the use of tenting. Now you can also see here when we compare the paste mask to the pad, that the paste mask and the pad basically overlap. So we have no expansion or contraction of the paste mask on that pad. So pretty standard pad and paste mask design in a PCB footprint. Now, the next thing that you notice about this pad, which I did mention, is of course all of the vias. Now, one thing you probably don't realize about this pad is that if I just copy this component and then I paste the footprint over here, you'll notice that the vias follow along with it. That is because these vias are built into the footprint for this component. Is this a good practice? Is this a bad practice? Let's go ahead and jump in a little bit to the use of vias on these packages and then how to design these footprints and what types of footprints you might find directly from manufacturers. So first, let's look at what types of leadless packages we might find in the PCB. And then let's look at some of the possible defects and issues. And then we can look at things like paste masks. So here on screen, I have some examples of leadless packaging. Of course, the most common one that I think most people will be familiar with is the QFN. A lot of ASICs are packaged as QFNs because of course, it lets you use them in high density assemblies. You also have some variations on the QFN style, like this Texas Instruments component that you see down here in the lower left. Texas Instruments is notorious for creating these packages, which they're not difficult to use or anything like that, but they do use these kind of non-standard pad arrangements on the component package. And so of course you have to design a custom footprint for it. You can't just reuse another footprint. BGAs, ball grid arrays, and LGAs, land grid arrays, also considered bottom terminated components because of course all the leads are on the bottom side of the package. So here we have the VSC7424, which I have used in several designs. And then here we have a power module from Vicor in the lower image here from Altium Designer. So several different types of components that might appear in this type of packaging. Now what we wanna focus on here for this question from James McCall is QFNs or QFPs that have a die attached pad. Mostly we're gonna look at QFNs. Now with bottom terminated components, one of the reasons 
uh, that we might put vias in that central pad is of course for thermal management. And that's one of the most commonly stated reasons for placing those vias. But there's another reason here which relates to assembly, which is to prevent voiding in the solder. When we deposit solder onto that central pad and then we put this package through reflow, the solder will spread around a bit and you can experience solder voiding on that pad. That could create a reliability issue if there are large voids on that pad. And that's especially the case if too much of that solder wets through to the backside of the PCB and then it has a much weaker bond onto the pad on the surface of the PCB. Now QFNs can also have via in pad. And this isn't just via in pad in terms of the die pad here in the center of the component, but the actual component leads around the edge can also have via in pad. Now, as is the case with any component where you're gonna have via in pad, there are potential reliability issues. You may need to fill and cap that via in order to prevent solder from being pulled in. Here in these microscope images, you can see we have an example with a blind via. Of course, a blind via naturally closed off, so it can't pull solder through. But if you did have via in pad on a QFN, you would want to plug and cap that via so that way you don't lose any solder through the via and then let it flow through to the backside. Now, one potential problem that can arise when we put these vias into this pad and then we plug and cap them is non-planarity. Non-planarity refers to the QFN package or other bottom terminated package not sitting flat against the PCB. So when we plug and cap the vias in this pad, they can have some dimples in them and those dimples can force the QFN to not sit flat on that PCB. The other thing that can happen here is you can get no clean flux residue underneath the QFN package, and this needs to be cleaned. So there are cleaning procedures that the assembler has to consider when working with no clean flux below these packages. Now there are reliability problems that can arise with QFNs in both cases. For example, with no clean flux residue, the residues can participate in electrochemical reactions and that can cause dendritic growth. In the case of QFNs not sitting flat on a pad during reflow, they could experience a little bit of skew where they just twist just a little bit and that can cause small solder fillets to form on the leads. And of course that creates low adhesion strength onto the PCB. What are some ways that we might solve some of these problems? Well, some of these problems are solved by engineering the paste mask or using a unique paste mask design such as in the drawing that you see here on screen. So this is where I start to recommend maybe the four square type paste mask design that I referenced in that review of John Hatfield's board. You can see here we have two examples. Here you have on the left the, the square design where you have square paste mask openings. And then here on the right, you have these strip paste mask openings. And then you have the vias running between the paste mask openings. Both options are available to you because you have the freedom to engineer the footprints that you want to engineer. Of course, you have to ensure that they can be reliably assembled, but it is up to you to do these kinds of things in your own footprints. Now, let's take a look at some manufacturer provided footprints in Altium Designer. We can see what they do, and maybe we can find some ways we can re-engineer their footprints to get better assembly results. Now I'm inside of a PCB doc file in Altium Designer and here in the manufacturer part search panel, I just searched for QFN. So I'm just searching for pretty much any component that has that kind of packaging. And of course, several options come up. So what I wanna do now is just look at what manufacturers might provide inside of their footprints. So let's just take a look at some examples. Here we have a component from Microchip. If I just hit right click and then place, you'll see here it comes up with a footprint. You can see here that they also placed the vias for this pad directly in the footprint. Let's look at the next one. Let's see if this is a common practice with microchip. Here, this other one from microchip, you can see they did the exact same thing, but the vias are of course different sizes. Let's take a look at this other component from Skyworks. If I place this component, you see that this component doesn't have any vias. So obviously it runs the gamut. You could have pads with vias, you could have pads with no vias, you could have pads with a small number of vias, a large number of vias, it really varies. And it seems to be the choice of the manufacturer whether or not you actually put the vias into the footprint or whether you require the designer to put the vias into the footprint. Now here, this text instruments component, you can see that it is of similar size as the Skyworks component. It is a 20 lead versus a 16 lead, but they are pretty much the same package size. And you can see here that they did include the vias, 
but they included them in an X pattern instead of in rows and columns. So even the pattern can vary across different manufacturer footprints. Next, let's take a look at the paste mask for all of these footprints. So here on the left component from microchip, you can see that they just opened up the entire pad. So the paste mask is totally open across the entire pad, and that's going to allow solder paste to deposit all over those open vias. Let's look at this next component from microchip. So they use the exact same via pattern, but they used a different paste mask pattern. And this is actually a first for me, I've never seen this. But what they did is they used small circular openings for the paste mask, and that's gonna deposit between those vias. And you can see that here when I turn on all the layers. This smaller component from Skyworks, you can see they did the same thing as the larger QFN. They just opened up the entire paste mask across the whole pad. There are no vias in this pad. And then they're gonna deposit paste everywhere on this pad. Let's look at this Texas Instruments component. Now, this one is interesting because they broke the paste mask into four squares. But what they did is they put those four squares on top of four of the vias that are already in the pad. So four out of those five vias are gonna get paste deposited directly on them. You can also see from the pin numbering that they did something else that's kind of interesting in this footprint. You can see here that pads six and seven have the pin designator in the middle of the pad, but eight, nine, and 10 have it out at the edge of the pad. Same thing on this side. They put pins one and two with the designators in the center of the pad, but they put them at the edge of the pad in three, four, and five. I'm not sure why they did that. Could be a mistake from whoever made this footprint, but regardless, it just shows the level of inconsistency that exists across all of these different packages, depending on size, number of vias, and what the designer chooses to use for the paste mask opening style. And I think if you were to keep looking through this very long list of QFN components, you're gonna find a lot of other variations and ideas for how to design the paste mask and how to design the footprint itself. Now let's go back into single layer mode for just a moment. Let's take a look at these vias. So I think it's appropriate to ask the question, should you use vias directly in the footprint for your component? Well, I don't think you should. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, these vias here in this component footprint might be smaller than what you actually want to put into your PCB. So you're gonna to have to go back and modify the footprint anyways. Now you could use the PCB list feature inside of All Team Designer to just select those vias and then change the diameter of those vias. However, anytime you update this footprint from the libraries, it's gonna change those via sizes back to what was originally defined in the footprint. So it basically undoes all of your work. In addition, you're not gonna be able to change the paste mask here inside of the PCB editor. You're gonna to have to take this component directly into the library and then modify it by hand. To do that, you can just draw the paste mask opening that you want and you can turn off the paste mask opening on the pad definition and that's gonna let you put a custom paste mask. The other reason that you might not want to put these vias directly inside the footprint for a component is because of routing. Those vias are gonna have a pad on the internal layer and maybe you wanna route underneath that QFN on an internal layer. Well, those pads on those vias are gonna limit your space that's available for routing. Now, do you need all 16 of these vias in this case or do you need all 16 vias in this case? Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't but if you have the freedom to reduce it to a grid of three by three vias, so maybe nine total vias, that gives you a little bit of additional space for routing on your internal layers. Another reason this is important is for fill and cap definitions. Now, again, because these vias are defined directly inside the footprint, you have to use the PCB list feature to go in and select them manually and then enable fill and cap for those vias, assuming that's how you want to build this board. Same thing with tenting. If you wanted to tent those vias, you would need to either use a design rule, maybe apply it directly to that footprint, or you would have to use the PCB list feature to go back and select those vias specifically and then enable tenting. However, if you do an update from the PCB libraries, you're gonna to have to remember that it will reset those settings to whatever is in the library and it could undo all of that work. And the final reason I think you shouldn't include vias in this PCB footprint is because of defining drill tolerances or defining positional tolerances. So if you select a via in a PCB layout, there is an option in the properties panel to define the tolerance on the hole size for that via. 
if you wanted to define the tolerance for the hole size on these vias and then have that tolerance appear in the drill table in your fabrication drawing, you would then need to make sure you apply that tolerance in the PCB library, not in the footprint in the PCB editor. Because anytime you do an update into the PCB editor from your PCB libraries, it's going to reset the tolerance value to whatever is defined in your library. And of course, that tolerance could be defined as zero or not applicable or some other number that you didn't intend. So I think the moral of the story is this. Whatever type of paste mask design and via placement you're going to use for these central pads on these bottom terminated components, make sure that you define the paste mask in the PCB library, but my recommendation is do not put the vias directly in the PCB library. You can if you want to, but it's not required. I prefer to do it in the PCB layout, and I always recommend that other people do the same. As far as the paste mask design specifically, I recommend that you design the paste mask so that you avoid these open vias. If that means you have to use fewer vias on this pad, that's okay. But just make sure that the paste mask opening that you define misses the openings on those vias. That's going to minimize solder wicking onto the back side of the board. And it's still going to allow for venting of any gases that are produced from that solder paste during reflow soldering. Thanks everybody for watching this video. Of course, we love getting your comments and questions. And if you leave a good question, just like John McCall's question, it might end up in one of these videos. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section for all of our videos. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator folks. We'll see you next time.